Rob, thank, thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I want to thank uh, Rob, uh, you know, for, for his friendship and for his advocacy. And he's been a very strong uh, vocal uh, critic uh, for, for publicly funded public education uh, across this province. And, and Rob's also been tireless. And I know he was going down memory lane, and we always go down memory lane. And I'll talk about summer for, for a few seconds, too. But during our last uh, round of bargaining, you know, we had many rallies across this province. And Rob, I believe, was at every one of our rallies speaking to our members and the public about the importance of what we were doing and what we were standing up for, standing up for our students so they have better learning conditions, which we know are our working conditions. And Rob was as tireless doing that. I just want to thank you again publicly for that, Rob. And Rob also makes it his business to actually understand what the issues are in education. He takes the time to do that. And that also shows in terms of the questions that he asks, which quite often go unanswered or with some kind of rhetoric. Wow, we've had some three amazing speakers who basically have said everything I'm gonna say. So I don't have a lot to say, but I will. <laughs> and uh, I, I know I'm very conscious of time. <laughs> and I'm conscious we've gone past the seventh inning stretch. We should have had. But I, you know, I want to welcome all of you here for taking the time out of your summer. And summer continues. And I know everywhere I've been this summer and talking with teachers, talking with you here, and uh, it sure was a different summer than last summer. Just that kind of more of that relaxation and more of the certainty in terms of what's ahead for us. And I see it on every basis. I saw it all around. And it's just so, so thankful that you are able to do, be here, and that you've taken on the roles in your locals, an important role, and the work that you do. And we have a strong public education system because of the work of all of you and all of our members. And you are also the face of the BCTF, so I just want to thank you for being here and thank you for taking that time. I also, um, we know that in, in our summer and the weather, and most of this province across Canada was good, except for maybe kind of, I think, Fort Nelson or Dawson Creek area. They had a little more rain than others. But I know that we had a lot of fires also across this province as, as elsewhere. And uh, I know one of the, uh, you know, the biggest fires most recently uh, was, was in the Rock Creek area. And uh, I just want to send out our, our, our thoughts um, to the community. And some of those communities are our teachers, our members, and the students they teach. And our hearts go out to um, everyone across this province uh, that has been affected uh, by fires. And I also want to um, uh, recognize uh, um, one of our colleagues, uh, Mark Bradshaw, who was president of the Mission Teachers Union, uh, who uh, passed away this summer. strong activist and a strong colleague, and he will be missed. And I also want to acknowledge uh, also one of our local presidents, Dave Harper, um, Campbell River, I believe wasn't able to make it because his daughter also suddenly died this summer. So I just want to have a minute of silence.
Thank you. So this year's theme, our rights, our movement, our strength, is about what you've heard tonight, for today, from our speakers. It's about us engaging with each other in broader social movements and the labour movement to create positive change in our schools, in our communities, in our provinces, in our country. And it's about our collective strength to defend our rights and advocate for others, because that's so important, because we are privileged. And we need to be doing that, and it's expected of us, and to bring about that positive change. And an ex example of that important work that's being done was recently by the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. By supporting its work and making sure that BC teachers were able to participate, we increased awareness amongst all of our membership and our communities. And with such a historic day on June 2nd, when Justice Marie Sinclair delivered the Commissioner's final report and recommendations, culmination of so much work and so much courage. And I want to thank and honour the thousands of witnesses who testified to the residential school experiences. And thanking them for sharing their painful stories with us so we can all learn from them and start that journey of reconciliation that we've been on. And that final report urged us to acknowledge the profound toll this cultural genocide, cultural genocide has taken on First Nations people. And to take those 94 calls to action to heart, to actually act, because that's what's important. And as teachers, we have such an important role to play in that, because the education system was used by the state and the church was at that root of that injustice. So education must play a central role in that reconciliation. And as a union and as professionals, we know and we are taking up that call for action. We will do what we can to help those efforts of reconciliation in our schools. And we're committed to supporting Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal teachers to continue that work in our classrooms across this province. And working together, building new relationships based on mutual understanding, respect, and collective action. And this is, work is happening and will continue. And one of the achievements that I believe, one of the strong achievements that we've also made is in that area of that curriculum redevelopment that's happening right now. And that we've pushed for strongly to incorporate Aboriginal content and perspectives across all grade levels, including the teaching of the true history of the residential schools. It's also about teaching the culture and the language, because that's an important part of any change that we have to make in our school system. And we know the power of education every day. It was spoken to by Hassan and Irene and Rob. And so we use it to acknowledge and commemorate our past. We take action in the present and we make positive change for our future. And you know, we actually even got the government to finally come out publicly that they are also committed adding more Aboriginal content in our curriculum, and they support that piece. And that, you know, it took a while to happen, but it's there because of our advocacy and the advocacy of our, some of our other partner groups, in particular FINESC. And, it, and it's really such an honor to, um, at the summer conference, to unveil, unveil the new um, Project of Heart teaching resource. This book called Illuminating the Hidden History of, Ind of Indian Residential Schools in British Columbia, which you all get a copy of. <laughs> a 
It's also an incredible re teaching resource that's going to be online and highlight some of our historical figures, both good and evil, in this dark chapter of this country. And it traces Aboriginal resistance to the injustices and offers the stories both of survivors and of one child who died in the residential schools right here in Kamloops. At this time, I also want to thank, in particular, uh, Gail Stromquist, our Aboriginal staff person, who has just did some amazing work in this area and putting this book together for us. Because it was a tireless effort on her part. And with Nancy. And to Nancy Nierkerbacher, who worked very closely with her in putting it together. And also, and also to Charlene Bearhead, who was also involved in this project from the beginning. Thank you. And to all other members of staff that uh, worked tirely uh, on this effort. And we know this will be a resource that will use, be used by not only teachers in British Columbia, but teachers all across this country. Because teachers all across this country, I find out more and more and more, and just recently I was at the uh, elementary teachers AGM in uh, Toronto, spoke about how they look up to the BCTF and how they use our website for our resources and how progressive we've been in a number of areas and in particular also Aboriginal education. And, and they actually were able to use us to leverage them getting a staff person fully committed to uh, Aboriginal uh, education. So we will use this resource. And again, I want to thank the survivors who've shared their stories with us, their courage, and their generosity and their stories is a powerful gift to BC teachers and students. Another issue we've been dealing with, and at summer conference, one of our workshops is on curriculum redesign, and that's full. There's about 110 people who have registered because people want to learn a little more about the new curriculum that's going to be unfolding here. And we can thank our members who are involved in these committees, over a hundred of them, in shaping what this curriculum would be like. Fewer prescribed learning outcomes, meaning teachers and students won't feel so pressured to be speeding through a curriculum that already has way too much in it. There will be increased ability for our members and students to focus on specific areas of interest and relevance to their communities. And teachers will continue to have the professional, a wide professional latitude to approach the curricula in multiple different ways and being able to reflect the interest of their students within that. And absolutely more opportunities for cross-disciplinary work. It's been a long process, and a process that will continue. Well, I mean, we still have concerns, though. And we go into these things with government with our eyes wide open. But some of the key questions on this curriculum still we have is the grad requirements remain undefined as so far. There's some lack of clarity on core competencies. BC Education's plan shifting priorities. And what we just found out recently, and whenever I'm also with government and, and some of the, the work that we're doing, making sure that we don't use the word the BC Education Plan. And even in their latest document to superintendents, it's not there. If we push away, because we know what that BC Education Plan was really about. And that was about trying to strip our, our collective agreements and stripping our rights. The Premier's musings and training 
adolescents for the LNG workforce, rather than actually offering and supporting holistic public education. And of course we know the new curriculum, the implementation piece of it, the resources and the funding have to be there, and that's totally, totally not there yet. And we have to keep working on that, and we will, and we're in discussions, and we'll be in discussions this uh, afternoon about uh, how that's going to shape. But you talk about broken promises, and um, the minister, the old minister, you know, wanted to talk to me in the latter part of June. It was so important. And uh, so I get on the phone with him, and he says, Jim, we've just been up in Kelowna, and I was able to get $3 million, a commitment from this government, for $3 million for curriculum implementation. And how can we work together to get that good news story out to teachers before they leave at the end of June? Well, Peter, $3 million? That's about $70 per teacher for, for widespread curriculum implementation. Way not enough. I mean, we'll take it. <laughs> but it's not a photo op. But a week and a half later, <laughs> in a meeting with the Deputy Minister of Education, Dave Bing, wants to talk about the implementation, the funding, and some visions they have, and of course we have our own ideas. And I said, yeah, three million to start, but you know it's not enough. We thought there was gonna be at least 10 million, and 10 million's not enough. And it's like the backtracking, oh yeah, okay, maybe, yeah, I know there's new money, but I don't know if it's three million. I think it's more like, I don't know, I don't really have a number for you, Jim, but maybe one million. I said, what? In a week and a half, you've already gone from three million to one and a half million? And that was before the Liberals found out that they made a mistake in their budget, that the $800 million surplus announced in February wasn't really an $800 million surplus, but that was over $1.2 billion or more. Wow. Anyway, area that we have to work on. It was a race. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Rob talked about Bill 11, and we'll be dealing with that aspect of it. And, and I, I again want to say, publicly say, and you will make the decision, teachers will make the decision in terms of what kind of action plan and how that Bill 11 plays out, but we're not going to accept any top-down mandated professional development or any top-down mandated <laughs> currency requirements. <laughs> That's our message. We'll continue that message. But we will support funding from government to enable every teacher across this province to access professional development where and when they want to in their own autonomy. <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> uh, this summer I was able to attend Education International's World Congress. It was held first time in Canada 190 countries, teachers from around this world, were there to discuss, debate, and inform one another. And you know, the challenges that they're experiencing, and I've talked about that before, is the same challenges that we're experiencing here, but also in different ways. But it was also an important reminder for us of that important international solidarity work that we do as a federation with teachers, unions, and places like Africa in Latin America and how very valuable it is and how very needed it is and how we need to continue that important work. I mean, it was clear that there's different degrees of intensity, different degrees of what's going on in different ways, but what was clear is that the rise of neoliberalism, austerity, dramatic cuts to funding for public education, attacks on the credibility of teacher unions and professions and the position of that punitive testing agenda and evaluation schemes on teachers. That was alive and well everywhere. And we've been at the forefront to resisting a lot of those initiatives and fighting those initiatives here in Canada, in British Columbia. 
And one of the issues for Education International this year, and it came out loud and clear at the forum, was unanimous concern for privatization and the commercialization of education. They came about the examples of education businesses promoting private schools as pay as you go. We heard that students in other countries, third world, fourth world, have to pay a daily tuition to come to class. And they will say, well, it's only $3 or $4 a day. Well, that's sometimes the wages of their families. Stories where children will have to stand on a street corner and sell bottled water or something else so they can go to school the next day. But they were willing to do that because they recognized the importance for them. And for us, what we need to do is beat back any forms of any kind of encroachment on publicly funded public education. And we have the commitment of Education International to do all that. And one of the biggest companies around involved in that for profit, and they also now have the contract for the OECD testing, the PISA, which we sometimes refer to, is Pearson International. And everywhere that we've gone, there's not a lot of fondness for Pearson from teachers and teacher unions across Canada, the United States, and this world. And I won't concentrate too much on this because we've heard a lot about it. But the federal election, two months from now, is an important, important, important piece of work that we need to do. And you know, we haven't been involved in federal elections too much in the past but we will in this one. Because, you know, it's time really to push the envelope. And you may have noticed that we've had a particular bias, maybe. <laughs> a purposeful, because we need change in this country. And it has to happen. It's been nine years. We've endorsed the time for change campaign. We've endorsed Better Choices campaign of the CLC. And it's time for us to take that initiative. And it's about educating. It's about educating our members. It's not telling our members to vote. It's about remembering the record and educating them about the issues and what we need and what we need to go forward with. And then members, the people, will make the decision and the importance of getting out the vote. But you know, we have to stop Harper. We have to stop Harper. <laughs> Our Aboriginal people need it. Our working sisters and brothers and the Postal Workers Union, CBC, PSAC, our federal counterparts, democracy is at stake. And the other institution at stake is the Supreme Court of Canada. Because if you change who's on the Supreme Court of Canada, you change the fab fabric of the highest institution in our country in terms of the law. And that Supreme Court has made some beautiful decisions recently. And we're depending on a Supreme Court in giving us that leave so we can take our case forward to ensure that we actually have real, full, free, collective bargaining in this province, in Canada, again, guaranteed, I don't know how many times, by the Supreme Court of Canada so we can push back our government again and, and get those class size provisions, class composition provisions, and minimum ratios back into our collective agreement so we can see a difference for our students 
and for our members so we can have more teachers actually working in our classrooms with our students to give them that individual attention they need. And that's what the Supreme Court is an important body and hopefully we'll be able to get and make our arguments there. And we will continue to stand up and we will continue to advocate for publicly funded public ed education because that's who we are. And we are stronger than ever and we will continue that. And as Irene said, yes, our social justice work because that also is who we are as a union, but I as also a union of professionals, which is another key aspect in that work that we do in ensuring that we control our professional development, our own professional learning, and that important facet in our organization, controlled by teachers for teachers, continues. And uh, as many people have said, if Alberta can change, Canada can change. And before I wrap up, I just want to send a special shout out to our teaching colleagues in Ontario. They were with us 100% during our strike. And I know, because many teachers talked to me in Ontario this summer, how they have valued our support in return. And they have so looked up to us because of the strong stand that we took against our government for our students, for our profession, and for our union. And I get to hear that from them. And I want to congratulate the secondary teachers in Ontario and the Catholic teachers who now have attended a settlement. And the Francophone teachers are bargaining this week, and the elementary teachers are there. But I just want to recognize the work that teachers in Ontario have done in their support for us and our support for uh, them. I'm wrapping up, Kelly, don't worry. <laughs> I have cut it short. But anyway, uh, again, thank you for everything that you do, because you are the heart, the face of our union right now here today for all of our members. Enjoy the next day and a half. Safe travels back home. And make sure you're here at the end, because we are finishing early on Friday, and we've got Jacques Demur happening some good entertainment and comedy. So stick around for that. Enjoy your time. And uh, summer is not over. <laughs> Thank you.